<laughs> and we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Freshman Podcast. We're here with Pesha McAdee from Exotic Car Hacks, guys. We got a lot to talk about. Let's get into it. Let's go. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Fresh Hit Podcast, man. We're here with Pejman Kadimi of Exotic Car Hacks, man. This is going to be a great one. This is actually Fresh's mentor, so y'all about to get some game right now. Yes, sir. Uh, Real quick announcement before we get into the show. Rumble.com slash Fresh Fit, because you guys know we're probably going to get canceled any day now. Who knows? So check us out. So when the day does come and they cancel us like our boy Tate (laughs) or Sneeko, you'll be able to find us somewhere. Freshfit.locals.com, guys. Get all the the behind-the-scenes content there, whether Fresh records before the show, double dates, all our old Patreon content. It's over there. Also, Megaphone, check us out so you can go ahead and get your headphone type content there if you know what I'm saying when you're at work. Especially the last podcast we did with Lucario Miles, it was fire. Make sure you don't play that one out loud because Miles will call on girls bitches. All right? <laughs> we all were kind of. But it is what it is. And then also check us out on uh, FresherPodcast.com. Get the merch there. Also, guys, Fresh and Fit Clips. Go subscribe to that channel. About 80% of y'all that watch that channel are not subscribed we're up in the content because <sighs> we are number one. I'm going to show you all that we're number one. I'm about to be Nelly in this bitch. Yo, eight shorts per day, six clips per day. Put out more content than anybody else. That channel's going to hit one million so I can get another gold plaque and flex on all the haters that doubted us, man. But the only way we're going to do that is we need you guys to subscribe to that channel. We're getting almost 40 million views on that channel yep. a month, but 80% of y'all aren't subscribed. If only a percentage of y'all, a higher percentage, a little bit, subscribed, we would be at one milli, so I could flex on the haters like Lagrant, like Lava and Leech, like uh, Layback, uh, Ethan Decline, and L3 Podcast, all of our haters, Lasan Fagabi. Yo, like the video, subscribe to the channel, Fresh Fit Clips. We're also, almost there. Yeah, we're almost there. Uh, also, Fresh, you want to talk about your vlog? Yes, guys. Vlog channel is still up. We did an actual uh, vlog as well before, me and Pejman. Yep. He told me what I need to work on and where I was still at. Even though I didn't want to hear it, it was the truth, man. So go check it out, guys. He is definitely not an asshole. He's just very truthful. And secondly, our, all our Dubai vlogs are up right now on the channel. So go check that as well. And lastly, we have the CEO Network that's live right now. Join the group, guys. Become better yourself. Become better man. And network to win. Cool. Patreon.com slash CEO Network there is the link. Uh, also, guys, check us out on FedEx 1811 uh, on their criminal breakdown. So we give you guys true crime. We give you all networking advice. We teach you guys how to get girls. Teach you guys how to make money. We bring... Um, People that know more than us when it comes to cars and business, etc., like Fishman here. So check us out. We're diversified behind that channel. True crime. I just did the K Flock breakdown on the federal indictments that came his way for racketeering. I break it down in detail and tell you guys what I think is going to end up happening with that case. But K Flock is in quite a bit of trouble. So Sheesh. check me out over there on Fed it. Not he's right like, now, of course. Watch this episode. He's and like, watch it later. Who's K Flock? Yeah, he's like, yeah, what the I hell? No idea that <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> he's a rapper from New York. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, but, <laughs> hey, President, welcome to the show. Man. Welcome to the show. Man. <laughs> In the yeah, house, the mom, yeah. the so we know who you are. I definitely know who you are. Fresh speaks very highly of you. Yeah. Um, but the audience might not know. Can you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Sure. So I'm Pejman Gadimi, but I go by PJ. Most of my friends and people that know me call me fucking PJ <laughs> because I just spill some truth about things that most people don't want to hear about. And reality is, by knowing these truths, your life just changes because you see from a new perspective that a lot of the system doesn't want you to see. So mm. I've done everything from authoring books on human awareness, consciousness, uh, down to creating platforms to teach finance through cars and watches. Uh, I held the youngest bank manager position in the country at 18, uh, all the way to an executive VP position back in my early 20s before getting fired. I established an investment firm that did half a billion dollars in revenue. So, you know, I've been through so many things through my life and today I'm just kind of semi-retired. Mm-hmm. I've kind of embraced the idea that I'm a teacher and that's mm-hmm. that's what I've kind of wanted to rest my life to look like. Mm-hmm. And so I teach and I teach unconventional wisdom. Mm-hmm. So it's things that you won't necessarily hear a lot of people talking about. Well, more people are talking about it now, but I've been talking about it for like 15 years, mm-hmm. you know, so and so I just like to help people become 
the better versions of themselves without imposing a value system on them. So this is a little bit different than what most people do because most people want followers, right? Like they're in their authenticity to basically go, here's my way of doing things. Here's what you should follow. Mm -hmm. My, I guess my teaching style is a little bit different where it's more about here's the universal truth that you're not told. Now, mm -hmm. how you abide to that is your personal way of adopting a value system that enables you to both navigate in and out of what you guys call that matrix, right? Mm. So <clears throat> the way I look at it is most people reject the matrix, you know, and they go like, oh, this is terrible. Like, what the hell, this is bullshit, yeah. fuck this. Mm. And I look at it differently where one of my big philosophies is the matrix is basically part of your life mm -hmm. and you don't have a choice but to abide by it. You mm -hmm. have to learn to master it before you can rise past it. And ah. so a lot of okay. times people have this hate towards the system and things aren't fair and they're not just and it's not working for them. But my argument is the more resistance you put towards the system, the more the system resists you. Mm. So a, a simple concept is in the United States, we're a capitalist country. Mm -hmm. So one of the easiest thing you can do is basically learn how to make money mm -hmm. and the game opens itself to you. You know, meaning you can see the rules in the back and adjust them and make them work for you. Yeah. But most people go, well, I don't need to do that. I just want the system to bend to my will mm. and my individuality, but I don't really care. You know, mm. like, I don't care about like, because the system's rigged, why would I play? Yeah. Well, well, it's rigged, so the way you fix it is not by bitching about it. Mm -hmm. The way you fix it is actually by working, getting rich, and then impacting your environment around it. So instead of being part of other rich people's experiences mm -hmm. that they control, you are ultimately the experience creator, and other people fall in that. Now, if you believe the game's rigged, then the experience you create doesn't have to be rigged for everyone else, mm -hmm. right? Like, you can create a... Uh, a joining experience where others can try, right? Mm -hmm. If you feel like the system was rigged for you. Yeah. And, and that's the arguments. The argument is not that the system's rigged. It is or it isn't, doesn't make a fucking difference. Yeah. You know, like it, because it's a reality you're going to live by. That you yeah. like it or not, you're going to get a ticket if you're caught running a red light. And, yeah. and the argument is you shouldn't bitch about why is there a fucking red light there? Yeah. You know, you should learn to comply until you're rich enough where you can go to the city and be like, remove that fucking red light. You know, yeah. I'm tired of fucking stopping there. Yeah. And I, I donate enough to the city. <clears throat> I don't want to run. I don't want to fucking be there. So a lot of times when we look at life that way, then we start to change the way we adopt our, a value system instead of just follow other people's day in and day out. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Um, you know, and when you were using the red light analogy, uh, I, I, as you were talking about it, I just came to my head. There's those that stop at the red light and comply fully and don't really know what else to do. There's those that run the red light and don't care about the consequences. Then there's those that can pass the red light and understand the consequences and be able to overcome them because they've created a certain uh, status and or stature or created enough resources where it doesn't matter. Well, but I want you guys to be the third. So the argument is it doesn't fucking matter because yeah. the red light isn't something worth fighting about. Does yeah. that make sense? So yeah, exactly. it's, it's a part of a societal norm we create, right? And that societal norm is really simple. Mm -hmm. It's the it's a societal norm that we are here to to thrive as individuals, but society has created a model where how we try, right, can, can change based on, you know, who you know and how things work. Mm -hmm. Well, a big part of that, though, is this system is made so you don't impose your ways on other people. Mm -hmm. like, like you have a societal contract and that societal contract that you like it or not is one that you live in and work in. And that's really simple. Like you stop at a red light because you don't want to cause an accident. Yeah. You don't stop at a red light because it's convenient or inconvenient. You do mm -hmm. it because you understand that the implication is one, you can cause an accident. Mm -hmm. Two, you can get a ticket if you're uncomfortable, whatever it is. But the point is you follow the societal norms the same way that you wouldn't go to a restaurant and fart next to the guy next to you yeah. and make him uncomfortable because you're like, hey, I'm not here to demolish your experience, just yeah. like you're not here to demolish mine. Mm -hmm. And the problem is most people don't realize that. So they feel that by imposing their ways, right? They're basically expressing their individuality instead of actually understanding that that societal contract isn't one that's negotiable. It's one that you have to get to the next level for. You know? Okay. All okay. right. So let's yes, take us back in time, uh, PJ, to when you were a kid. What was that growing up in your childhood? And were you always successful? Were you always rich? Like, nah. what was it like going back? I, I wish. Things would have been much better. <laughs> I grew up really poor. Actually, let me rephrase that. I grew up really rich in, in Iran. And I was three years old and left because of the revolution. So we became really poor as a result. Mm. Became refugees in France with nothing. I lived in a basement all the way for about four or five years in France. Then my mom finally, a single mom. So she worked hard to get us uh, basically like a, an, a, an apartment. And then we basically were on survival mode 
what so your, so your father wasn't involved at all? No, my dad left when I was three. Basically, ah, he wanted okay. to stay in the revolution. In Iran caused a lot. He was like the head of a bank there. And ah. my mom was the head of a state department. So there was a lot of issues gotcha. with the government, you know, and he complied with the new government. My mom was like, we need to get out. Mm -hmm. So she took me and left. He said he would come. He never came. Whatever. I never saw my dad again until I was 30 in Dubai once. Mm -hmm. So um, wow. but other than that, it was like one of these things where we left there, went to France because we wanted to come to the U.S. They wouldn't let Iranians come to the U.S. So mm, yeah. we ended up going to France. France was good, but my mom worked really hard to build a business. Didn't really thrive. She just kind of got enough to pass through. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we finally, after 10 years of perseverance, she finally got a visa to come to America. Mm -hmm. But she had to convince them that basically she was going to get to America and come back. You know, like and uh, she was going to yeah, stay. Yeah, yeah. And so she left everything behind again took mm -hmm. the only 30 grand she had saved all these years and basically headed to America where we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So we get here. She spends that 30 grand basically trying to get us a green card by standing up a coffee shop, completely miserable. Uh, again, we're back at living in a basement. You know, yeah. so it's the same cycle starting over and over. How old are you at this point? When, uh, I was, when I came here, it was about 95. So I was roughly like 13 years old. Okay. And so when I finally get here, the main thing that I realize is I'm seeing my mom basically degrade, right? Go from this very powerful person in government to now being like, hey, I'm so you're 41 now. Or I'm 40? 40, well, 40. I'm going to be 41 this year. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the point was, she just couldn't do it anymore, and she ended up being a cashier at my uncle's restaurant. So I was like, mm. like clearly, my mom doesn't have the energy to build out anymore, and she's yeah. been beaten. So I said, you know what? Done. I'm going to work. The problem was, I didn't have my green card yet. Mm. You know, so I started doing whatever it was. It would beg McDonald's to let me clean floors for three dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. They were like, no, can't do that. You're not legal, whatever. So this is 95 at this point. Uh, I was like 96. 96 or so, now. Yeah. Okay. so then I go, I end up going to uh, wash cars for the neighborhood. You know, like a couple. I used to wash cars for a dollar. Like mm -hmm. that's how bad it was. I was like, I just want to do if I do anything, even make a dollar mm -hmm. is better than making nothing. Where like, are you at at this point in the United uh, States? I was I was, first I went to L.A. for a year. Okay. Then I came basically to uh, Virginia, Northern Virginia. OK. And then in Northern Virginia, I was cleaning cars for rich people, you know, living in my uncle's basement. Uh -huh. And my mom was going as a cashier and I was like, I got to do something. So I finally ended up getting a job as a telemarketer that doesn't check my green card. I had a Social okay. Security like card yeah. and they let me in to basically give me a job. And okay. I go. Great. Like I got a job. It's 12 an hour is way better than a dollar an hour. Yeah. And I hated telemarketing because I didn't even know what it was. I thought it was customer service. I didn't understand what that word meant. But I understood that I didn't have a choice and I had to make it work. So I went from I hate telemarketing to making 2,500 bucks a week selling windows and roofing because the only thing I did. That was a lot of money back then. Right. A lot of money. Yeah. Right. Especially for a child. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And the main thing was the main thing was I didn't really care. Like it wasn't about like what was I doing. The main thing for me was. It was about, look, I have the ability here to make phone calls instead of wash cars. And that was a big deal. That was comfortable. It was going into an office instead of in the cold, like winters in Virginia are brutal. Yeah. You know, and I was trying to wash cars with like quick detail spray. It was freezing on the car. It was a disaster. So I was like, I can't lose this job. Like, this is a great job. Like, I got to have it. And I pushed. And in three years, I became director of the company. And I made basically I was doing everything from service to sales to everything else. And that's the experience I took when I finally got my green card and everything was set. Mm -hmm. And I had, my mom had a friend that worked at her bank locally, like where she did her deposits. And she was like, have him come in for an interview. I impressed the right people. I became a bank manager. But I became a bank manager, not to be fair, not in a giant bank that was beautiful and millions of dollars in deposits, but either in one of those supermarket banks, you know, like uh -huh. in one of those internal banks. Yeah. Mm. And like then, a people's bank at a stop and shop. Yeah, yeah like exactly. But yeah. you in Virginia, you guys would call it a giant. Exactly. Nice, like yeah. in a giant at the time, like there was a company called Chevy Chase Bank. It was a pretty big bank in the Northeast. And they had these, you know, basically these little sales centers inside these banks. Mm -hmm. And sales was the main thing that they were looking for, sales experience. You know, and I was a great salesman. I didn't know much about banking, mm -hmm. but I knew everything about sales, service and everything. And they gave me a team of five and they were basically like you go through a six month training program learn how to be a manager. I graduated in four months. I got out and basically I was like, now I was running a bank, which was a big deal. And I took that really seriously. Um, something very interesting I noticed from the story you just told was that you fought to work versus oh, yeah, so many it. Americans <laughs> fight to not work. And I've talked about this a lot because my, my parents are immigrants as well. And luckily I was born in the United States, but they always used to tell me, you know, if I was born in this country, I'd be as somebody. This is a great opportunity, et cetera. And what you're showing is that you didn't even have the documentation, but you fought to get a job and earn money versus most Americans are just lazy and don't understand the opportunities granted to them. 
How much of an impact was it to come from uh, you know, a war-torn country and have to fight for the ability to just simply make money? So I was too young to see. Um, I remember some aspect. I remember once being in a basement uh, with my mom and my dad when I was very young mm. and an actual, literally an air raid going on where mm. the building next to us, like a tall tower like you see in Sunny Isle, shit was gone Bruh. Like 10 minutes after. <laughs> like we, we heard the siren, you hear this boom, you think you're like, blind and deaf and you know like you're dead right yeah. but you're not it's just the noise of what just happened yeah and then you think you like everything's in a silent movie but you don't realize you can't hear and everyone's still screaming mm. buildings collapse there's smoke everywhere you're in a basement like hoping the next one doesn't drop on you and and my thing then that was just as a child you know i didn't really understand then yeah. but yeah. as i grew up watching my mom try basically like to to work and try to keep going just told me, look, there's this woman that's like old, right? Like mm -hmm. she, she's not young. Like she was in, her, my mom had me late in her forties. So, oh, wow. You okay. know, so she, you know, she's in her fifties going on 60 and she's working as a cashier trying. Yeah. And, and the thing for me was just the power of trying to work. And this is the same thing we we're talking about, not avoiding the matrix, right? It's like, Hey, I want to work for myself. I want to have money. I want to be my own boss. Or you know what? Like having a job is an incredible thing too. Yeah, because it's an opportunity to earn skill yeah. when I didn't have any. Like I barely spoke English the right way, you know. Yeah. Like so, to me, that was just an opportunity that I couldn't just not take. And so for me, it was more about understanding that survival isn't about opinion. Survival is just a reality mm -hmm. that I had to face, and it was a reality that needed action to change. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a better plan. And a lot of times we get stuck on I need a perfect plan, and that was a plan. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a plan is better than no plan, right? Yeah. Or, or I'm thinking about my plan or my next move. And so I've always been that a kind of action driven type of person. And that's why I kind of, you know, went that path where I take it very seriously when even today, like I have companies where I, people pay me for a service, right? And they don't expect me because I have teams of employees that do stuff. Mm -hmm. And I take it very seriously when I, when someone pays me a dollar, a thousand dollars, $10,000, I give them the same respect. Mm -hmm. and, and I, and I give them that because I understand the power of that exchange, right? That value exchange. And that to that person, that hundred dollars is the same as to the other person, a thousand dollars, the next person, $10,000. So everybody has a different value. Yeah. Their expectation of what they get for that value also has to be reciprocated the same way, just like a job, you know? And that's what the thing is with a job. Someone is paying you a wage and there's an expectation at wage, mm -hmm. but people look at that as a negative and they go, well, that wage isn't enough. Well, you accepted the job, Yeah. right? Why the fuck are you working there? If you don't want to, like, if you don't want to work there, then go prove you have better skills. Get a better job. Yeah. And then like PJ, what he does, right? No matter what it is, it could be car washing. It could be, for example, working at a bank, tele teleperformance call, whatever, it doesn't matter. He does it to the best of his, his ability, which means, for example, he's not going maybe 50%, it's 100% and plus. Yeah, it but doesn't even like, matter what the return is. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter like you paid me $10 million or $500 for something. Yeah. The effort you get towards what I promised would happen, regardless that I deliver it or someone that works for me delivers it, is the same no matter what. Mm, okay. Tell us a little, a little bit more about the bank, because obviously mm -hmm. speaking, you're young, you're working at a mm -hmm. bank, you're trying to work, work your way up. What was that like? It was really frustrating because the first, it, like the first year, was basically getting a bunch of older people that are much older than me that worked there for a while, that no banking and everything, try to persuade them that a young person like me that was their new boss <laughs> and that was going to be okay. So, mm. so the first thing is all the resistance. Like, why the hell is this guy here? Yep. Why and you're an immigrant, I... so they're going to look at you like, fuck that. Like, I mean, I was lucky because most of them were immigrants, too. I had an okay, Indian, sweet. a black guy. You know, right, like, good, so, good, so good. it was okay. Because like, when it's Americans, like, a lot of times they're I'm looking again, like, why is this immigrant guy leading us? Like, the us? age okay. was a real issue, right? It was yeah. like, hey, first, no experience. Yeah. Like, two, the age. And it was a kind of a, why the hell is this happening? But yeah. the big thing that was really important there was that I took that opportunity seriously, meaning I sat there. At the beginning, like I would get there earlier. I got there three hours early to learn the banking products on the computer. Mm -hmm. I would leave three hours late to learn more banking products just to catch up. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't like, oh, my nine to five, I have to be here nine, I'll leave at four, okay, party time. I was like, I have been giving an opportunity years ahead of what I should have. Somehow I convinced the guy to believe in me enough to give me that. Mm -hmm. Now I have to honor that commitment yeah. by actually doing the work that I was paid to do like yeah. i'm paid today to do that work they're not like i'm going to withhold 30 percent of your pay until you learn this and then you're up you have to deliver on that no matter what because you've accepted that agreement that's what i was talking about when someone says i'm going to accept like eight dollars an hour well you accept that doesn't matter that it's good or not you don't have to work there go fucking find something else to do you know mm -hmm. if you don't like it right so let me ask you this obviously speaking i know your story a little bit better 
but you worked at the bank and you start getting a lot of money working, you know, mm-hmm. adding value, becoming that guy. But then you start buying cars. How do people react to you buying those cars at your job? So that was a big issue too, because bankers at back in the day, not today, is more. What year is this now at this point? So my first banking job was back in two thousand. Like okay, it was I just turned eighteen, just graduated high school. That's mm-hmm. when I kind of started going, like late eighteen, early nineteen, mm-hmm. and eighteen as in year of age, not year of the. But in two thousand, basically, like about a year and a half after I started working at the bank, I was making six figures. I oh, always, nice. Yeah, I was, so in year 2000, you're making $100,000. 2001, 2002, okay. I was making Quite like 125. Yeah. So like, that's a lot of money for a kid. Yeah. Again, like, and, yeah. and it's a salary plus bonus and stuff. So very, very attractive pay, right? Yeah. And I took that again, very seriously. That's like, a purchasing power just for the people out there nowadays of around maybe almost $200,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Compared yeah. to what you would yeah. do today, which Back is very different. Yeah. Correct. So I was buying, like I decided, you know what? I didn't have any hobbies. I didn't do anything on my own time, whatever. I've always loved cars. So my first car, even at 17, because I was making money as a telemarketer, was a, like it was a nice Firebird, then a Mustang and a Cobra and stuff. So I would buy myself nice stuff when I was a kid. And as I grew and obviously made more money, I continued to continuously buy myself nice stuff. And uh, I eventually was a bank manager, right? And eventually I became a regional manager and then a VP. And I was driving a 911 Turbo at the time, oh, wow. you know, then to a Gallardo, a 360 Modena. So really cool cars, you know, like they I don't enjoyed Gallardos anymore, right? I mean, they don't make Gallardos today. No, yeah, they, you still anymore. can buy a used Gallardo today. Yeah. But yeah, back then I bought a Gallardo for like 80 grand. You know, Sheesh. like, but people didn't know. It. Like, <laughs> oh, wow. know okay. Even today, yeah. like you got people in Miami driving around with like Gallardos, people praising them, trying to suck their dicks and shit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at I'm that like, and bro. I'm like, your mom's Range Rover probably costs more than that. And you're wow. not trying to like kiss her ass on how'd you get successful, right? Yeah. yeah. You used to have those in the old music videos way back in yeah, the days exactly. all like, the so, time. Yeah, it's so, the most popular yeah, yeah, it, it, It's the thing. But the, the argument was it really wasn't that expensive. I just knew how to buy it. And most mm. people didn't understand how cars worked because exotic cars were fairly new then. Today, they're very streamlined across uh, the board. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of learned something then that people didn't know. And over that, I basically took that teaching and everything I knew about cars, eventually when I got out of like banking, cause I got fired for being a dick, <laughs> which is okay. Like, I don't mind saying I completely. You were just pushed. like, do you mind telling us that story? Uh, yeah, I, I had a side business that basically, so long story short, I was an asshole my whole banking career. Like, because I was <laughs> just mean, better. Like, mean, even now? <clears throat> no, yeah, even now. Well, but that's fine. I was, I was an asshole because I was better than everybody else in the bank. I okay. know it sounds fucked up, but my performance was better. Mm-hmm. I delivered more mm-hmm. and I was always driving better results with less work. So mm-hmm. I I showed up less. I would go to work at 11 uh, and I'd leave at four. Mm-hmm. I, I had plenty of times when I even banged tellers in between. Like I didn't care, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> so, I had fun, right? like yeah, I yeah, did yeah. my thing. Mm-hmm. And I had a ton of issues all the time where like people were like, oh, this guy's never in the office. He doesn't give a shit. But my performance was there. So they couldn't say shit. Mm. And I would park my Lamborghini where my boss's parking spot was when I would go to corporate <laughs> and shit. And people, he had his Maxima next to me. And like people would be like, oh, I want to work for him, not for him. And he's yeah, like, what yeah, the yeah. fuck? So I would piss off people. And mm-hmm. I had these cars were driving a lot of attention. It's like, uh-huh. this guy's got a yellow Ferrari. He's got a, you know, sick ass Lamborghini and it's loud. And what was happening is people were starting to ask questions like, how does he do it? What does yeah. he do? And, and you're making two about, you said back then, just so the audience understands, yeah. about $120,000, $130,000 a year. The, at my peak in banking, uh-huh. like at the end before I got fired, I was making two hundred k a year and okay. I had a million dollar bonus. Wow. So that was a good time at the end. Yeah. This was 25. Now okay. we're not in 25 years. Okay. So, so now we're at like 2004, 2005 at this point. No, this is like, I, I got canned in late 05, 06. Okay. okay. So it's like 04, like 03, 04. I'm a regional manager doing great. And I got basically like a couple of banks under my belt. You know, okay. and but, you, but you didn't buy only cars though, right? You bought other investments? Mm, no, mainly cars, watches. Mm. I did a lot of real estate. Like I bought, actually okay, I had yeah. a really neat trick where I was buying lots pre-08, where nobody knew that you could basically cheat lots from like big builders, where you committed to lots with a $10,000 deposit uh-huh. and you never actually did, you would flip the contract over. So <laughs> oh, I did wow. that 72 times. So I basically became a millionaire before I got canned. Oh. And that created a lot of issues too, because my cars get better and my life got better. Uh-huh. And so I was doing this on the- so like, 200, You were making 200K per year, plus and and you were already a millionaire but, from flipping contracts. Well, not, not, not then, but a couple of years later when that- came to fruition before the 08 crash. Like I basically had flipped 72 plus contracts before 07. Oh, w so, in the chat, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is this was my game. My game was a money. Fuck you, game. money, literally. Well, it was yeah. a money game at the time, yeah. and and I had no expenses. I had yeah. no wife, no kids, no nothing. I was to take care of my mom at this point. She's no longer, you know, going to be a cashier anywhere. Nobody cares. You know, I'm buying her stuff, and the the entire argument was that we we were now in a place where we had freedom. 
Yeah. Not not full fuck you freedom, but some level of freedom. Yeah. We bought our first 200K house. 200K in 05 is a lot. That's I like 400K now. I mean, listen, almost. having a Gallardo back in 05 was a big fucking deal. You yeah. Know? Like, it, yeah. Even when I got my Mercilago, I remember that was a big fucking deal. Like everybody was like, holy shit. Like, and especially remember in DC, it's conservative. Like watching these. Yes. It's not like here where like everybody's got a yellow car and it's got doors up and shit. Back then, we were like kings for that shit. Yeah. You know, you show up at a club, people would pay yeah. you to show up. The whole DMV area is yeah, like exactly. That. And yeah. here, like, they park your ass in the back and live. They don't even give a fuck that you're in the front. <laughs> have mercy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They don't care. It's old people shit. You know, they're like, yeah, you're yeah. poor. So there's a very different mentality back then to what it is now. And this was a really, really good time for me to basically just learn how to make corporate America work with this. But to answer your question, that why I got basically canned this, I would show up with these cars. It would trigger a lot of things. Uh, they started asking me, what are you doing? You know, people started calling like HR complaining, like this guy's oh. got a, I, I, I would get a call a week. I had to make up shit. Like my uncle's a Saudi prince, <laughs> all types of shit, like <laughs> filling in the stereotype. Yeah. And eventually I got to this place where I said, you know what? They came to me and they go, Hey, we want a written statement of what your next business is, what you're doing, like how much revenue you're doing. Because apparently they had this clause where you couldn't like have a side business in the oh. bank. So I said, you know what? I thought I was so fucking bulletproof. Was your side business the flipping of contracts? No, no. I had a side thing where I was working on cars. I was tuning cars and shit. Ah, and not okay. for money. I was just doing it because I enjoyed it. I, didn't yeah. my, I wasn't making anything doing it. Like, okay. But I didn't want to tell him about the contracts because there was a real estate oh. thing. So I basically said, hey, my money comes from the side business. Okay. When they asked me, like, show us what it is, et cetera. I said, I'm bulletproof, bitches. You're never going to touch me because I'm the top tier, the motherfucker that's basically making you all the money. And guess what happened? I was like, here's my badge. You're going to fucking call me back tomorrow and tell me to fucking come to work. You know, like the VP of the bank is going to call me and blah, blah, blah. And next day, nobody called me. <laughs> like, oh, fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah. They're like, good riddance. Yeah, <laughs> like, he smart. basically fired himself. We don't even have to fire him. Yeah. Okay. And I walked out and went, fuck myself. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I mean, you were the man back then, though. You, you, you know, you had a side business, you're making money. So it's kind of like, yes, it kind of hurt a little bit, but you know what? You were free. Well, you know what it was is even though I had this is I never forget this. I got fired and, mm -hmm. I, and, and, and like I got fired because I fired myself, meaning I threw my badge and I said, it's never coming. So the, the most interesting thing that ever happened is uh, it took me a year to figure out what I wanted to do because I took okay. a year. And I remember that this was right the moment where I was about to take delivery of a Mercy Lago. So this was like it was right that time where I'd ordered this fucking car mm -hmm. and it was coming in and it was a lot of money. It was like 400 plus grand. Oh, wow. Yeah. And at the time, remember, I had this income and I had this job and, yeah. and this houses hadn't come to fruition fully so i didn't have like all this capital and everything else gotcha. so i'm sitting there and they just call me and they're like hey your car's here you know basically come fucking pick it up yeah and i'm like thinking to myself i'm like fuck do i really want to drop 400 grand you know on a fucking car in the middle of this bullshit. oh you were buying it outright cash yeah, yeah, yeah then that was the thing so this is the interesting part that happened well i didn't know i was going to buy a cash or finance at the time yeah. i had a job to finance shit now yeah. i didn't right yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, a yeah. Different exactly story. exactly so when I went there, one thing that happened, I asked my mom, I remember I was like, should I fucking buy this? And she was, she told me something really interesting. She said, would, would you have bought it if you were employed? I said, yeah, well, of course. Well, why wouldn't I? She said, then don't let him keep you from doing what you were going to do. Then figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. So I said, that's a good way to think about it. Because she said, once you don't do it, you let people take away your power. Mm. Once you do it, you reclaim your power by figuring out how to get back to the top where it makes financial sense to own it. Yeah. Mm. So I said, that's interesting. I said, okay. So I did it. And what I did, this was really interesting. I remember going to this fucking place that was like Rocco's Tacos you guys have here. I don't even remember. I think it was called Uncle Julius there. <laughs> I know it's fucked up, right? But anyway, so I would park this car and I would go to read a book like because I, was, I just didn't know what I wanted my next business to be, what I really wanted to focus on. And I had lost the one thing that happened when it did that to me is I lost my purpose. It wasn't really, I hadn't lost money because I had, I knew I had these things fruiting and I, I, was, I wasn't poor. I had saved a ton of money. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wasn't going to go broke or anything. But something really powerful happened as I was sitting there and I was like, I just don't know what I want to fucking do. And I was like, I thought I was going to be a banker for life. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that you know, after sitting there, just staring at my fucking car for like weeks at a time, like just going to the same fucking restaurant, sitting there ordering chips every fucking day. I couldn't tell if it was depression or I didn't lose a purpose or whatever it was. And it suddenly hit me. I was like, they didn't take away my purpose because they take they can't take away what I know. Mm -hmm. They can't take away my skill. They can't take away my knowledge. I'm still PJ, the fucking money guy. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, now nah, I just got to find a way to prove to people that I don't need that sign behind my desk that says, hey, I work for this company. Mm -hmm. So I started a consulting company. And I was like, I'm going to teach people how to fucking make money, you know, and I'm going to teach them how to grow the corporate ladder. And I had all these things. And you know how much money I made in the first year in business? Take a guess. Well, they say most businesses aren't profitable the first year. Yeah. How much money, but... how much revenue did I make in the first year of business? How many clients did I get? Uh, how much revenue? Yeah. Okay. Not gross. Gross revenue. Let's say 100,000. What do you think? 50 to 100? 30K? Zero. Wow. Damn. Nothing. Holy. Not one time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know your business idea is fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one wants to pay for it, right? Yeah. Like, so you're just like, well, that didn't fucking work. Yeah. So I'm like sitting there and I'm like, fuck. Like, that was Damn, bad zero idea. dollars, bro? Yo, nothing. Couldn't even get one single client. Did you want to like, give up? Huh? You don't want to give up? No, the thing was, I wasn't sold on the idea. I just thought I could continue my career. What I didn't realize was that I was doing it wrong. I was trying to basically fight and revenge fuck my boss. Doesn't make sense? Like it was gotcha. kind of like, yeah. and I was like, that's not, but that's not, it doesn't matter. Like I'm revenge fucking something that doesn't matter. Like it doesn't make a difference. So I was like, I have to figure out an angle to like, what do I want the next 10 years to look like instead? Instead of worrying about what, how can I prove to the past that I'm better? I was like, I have to basically think about what do I want the next 10 years to look like? Cause it's not fucking banking anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided to basically combine banking with my love for cars. And as a result, I basically decided to create the world's first investment fund that focused on cars. Okay. And, and at the time, I was like, I know shit about cars. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like, I know shit about cars. Nobody knows. And so I started fucking basically figuring out not just how to create a dealership and sell cars, which is completely something I didn't want to do, but instead, how to actually have people invest in cars with me and make money together. And so I started a firm back then. This was like 2006. Okay. Uh, end of 2005, 2006, I started it. You know, at first it, I made like 300 plus calls. I didn't get a single fucking person to want to jump in. Mm -hmm. But eventually I got two to three people that were like one at a time started coming over. They're like, yeah, the recession is kind of getting near. You know, we're thinking like things aren't going to last in real estate. Yeah. I had liquidated at that point a bunch of my real estate. So uh -huh. I was like, I'm going to now start buying cars. And people were like, buy cars in the middle of a recession. Like, you know, it's coming. Yeah, yeah, that's, Are you that's, out that's, of your fucking mind? Yeah. And I was like, no, I think this is a good idea. Yeah. Everybody thought I was retarded. But I said, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to go and do that. So I did that. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And then so when I, you liquidated, uh, how much did you were you able to get back? Uh, all in, my total cash in hand was over $3 million. Okay. So you liquidated all those contracts. You had, you said 72, No, I right? flipped them. Yeah, you 72 them. over time, not yeah. all in one day. So you yeah. got three You got three mil and you took that and you just invested it into your business and you're saying, I'm going so all in. I went all in so bad that I ran out of money <laughs> literally a month <laughs> after going in. What? And that's when that I had three to, mil. Yeah, that's when I had to start because I bought cars yeah. that were distressed cars from people that were getting scared. Okay. And I started putting these cars in inventory and then I realized, well, first I bought a ton of shit. I have zero cash flow. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how I'm going to make money. I have all this shit, but Things that go down don't go up tomorrow. Yeah. You know, like they yeah. go up down the road. So I'm yeah. like, well, how the fuck does a business needs money now? So I started thinking, I was like, well, what if I can get other people to invest in these cars? Like, and I'll, I'll manage them and they can park their money in them mm -hmm. instead of stock market. I was like, they're scared. I was in banking. Some of these guys are my old clients. They'll trust me. They'll mm -hmm. come over. One of them did. A second one came. A third one came. And eventually, boom. Like now I had a business model. Mm -hmm. The model. And I, again, this is like literally throwing shit at a wall and trying to figure it out uh -huh. and with all this money. And so just so I can, uh, cause I really want to understand this for yeah. the audience too. So you took the, you liquidated, got the three mil, invested it, bought distressed vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. Are these like typical sedans, like not exotic cars at this point? These, no, these are all exotic cars. Oh, they're all exotic all cars. Exotic cars. So it's distressed... not that many if you think about it, cause okay. a car is like two, 300 grand. Yeah. yeah. So you we're have... not talking about like, a hundred cars in you know in inventory. We're, yeah. we're talking about like fifteen cars. You okay. Know, so you most. had fifteen exotic cars. When you say distressed, do you mean as in like it had some minor damage? No, to it distressed or... meaning person wanted to sell it. Yeah, exactly. Like oh, people were getting seller. yeah, okay. basically yeah. people okay. getting just like foreclosures and people basically yeah. being in a position where they what were like the getting scared. And, and at that point, remember, dealerships started pulling back and saying, "Hey, we're not buying cars right now. We're trying gotcha. to figure out what's going on." We're trying to figure out what's going on with our inventory. What are we going to do? Same shit that was happening like three months ago in December. If you okay. actually paid attention to the car market, yeah. a lot of people are pulling back scared because, oh, what's going to happen? Is there a recession coming? You know, uh, floor plan interest rates went to the roof for dealers. So they were scared. They were on a mm. buying freeze. So all these things happen. A lot of people don't know. You know, they don't know how this works. So they just get it. Like people, when they get scared, they follow everyone else yeah. into the pit. Right. Yeah. And that's the problem. Like 
I, all my friends were like, we're going to dump our cars in December. I'm like, don't fucking do that. Yeah. And then in February, the market rebounded, you know, and they were like, fuck, I lost like a hundred grand on my car. I was like, I told you don't fucking do that shit. It's stupid. If you notice, right. I'm surprised PG takes L's. So you took how many L's there? You, you lost money yeah, on already um, buying all those cars. Mm -hmm. You lost money as well before. Mm -hmm. And like, you're trying to figure out what to do. We, yeah. never, we never gave up. That's powerful, man. No, I mean, if and you then, and then, hold, on, hold on, just after this as well, you made a video called legally stealing money, stealing a car from a dealership. Yes. And that's what, and that's what they probably hit you as well. But you figured out the system behind the car dealership, how to make it work. It's yes. powerful. Well, I kept losing money at first on cars. So uh -huh. yeah. before I bought my exotics, I had all these like Mercedes E class, S classes and shit. Yeah. And I realized I'm losing every time I get in the dealership. The guy tells me like the car he's selling me is the hottest thing on the market. The one I'm trading in is terrible. Mm -hmm. And then a week later, I want to give him back his car because I, I had I did this on a car. I bought a CLS and I, I didn't. I bought an e, E5, E55 AMG. I hated the car. So mm -hmm. I went back to the dealership a week later and I was like, hey, trade me on the CLS 55 sitting there. Mm -hmm. like, I just want to trade up. Like I'm thinking he's going to take be like, oh, I'll charge you five grand because you just bought the car. Oh, he's like, yeah, it's 27 grand less. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? What I just bought hell? this last week. And yeah. he goes, well, you know, the market shifted. I'm like, what the fuck? The market doesn't shift in like three and a half days. Like, what are you talking about? Like, he's like, no, it just, it shifted. What the fuck? So I started realizing that these guys are basically playing this game. And I said, if a dealer's making money on every fucking trade that comes in and out, then how come, why, why am I going there to fucking deal shit? Like, yeah. It doesn't make sense because I'm yeah. losing in every position. I exactly. lose on the buy, lose on the sell. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to learn what the fuck they're doing and basically do it on my own. And Damn. that's, that's how, like I started the idea of figuring out how to buy shit mm -hmm. at better pricing. And that, that, Basically, during my entire banking career, just had nicer cars, being able to buy better shit at a discounted price because I understood how to buy it. Mm -hmm. Unlike a dealership that would rape you, you know, and be, I mean, it's not that a dealership rapes you. Let's let's be clear. A dealership is an intermediary business. Yeah. Right. Like it's not they're middlemen. It's not evil. Like it's just what they do. Like their job is to make money. They're not paying for that giant fucking building you see on the side of the road with like glass and fifteen hundred fucking cars in there by just making five grand a car. They, yeah. you know, they do it because they're making 20, 30 grand a car and they can. That's their job. Your job as a consumer is to become intelligent enough, not just to clown up and be like, whatever that guy says, my my car salesman is my best friend, mm -hmm. which is complete bullshit. So going back to the story, so mm -hmm. you have, you spent 3 million, you got these 10 or 15 exotic cars now mm -hmm. at this point, you get a couple of investors to come in and invest in those, these mm -hmm. vehicles that you have, that you purchased from the yep. distressed sellers, then what happens? Well, then I repeat the same problem and I'm out of money again. Mm, so you got more, so you got the investors, mm -hmm. got that money. Got and maybe, then I freed up my money. Okay. So I went and did and repeated the same mistake again. So to, to more else. Wow. Yeah. So you because, spent another what two, three million? No, another like two and a half. This time I left five hundred K in case I needed money to live. Wow. Damn. And you know why I did that? Because I believed I didn't necessarily believe in my business model. I believed that people would always get richer. Mm. And and this was and I believe this was the birth of exotic cars as a whole. Okay. Wow. So, so I didn't necessarily believe in myself because I would say I hadn't proven I can make money. Like, what was there to believe in? Mm -hmm. But I believed in the idea that what I was doing wasn't fucking stupid. You okay. know, just like saying you can invest in real estate and know that long term, no matter what, yeah, it's always kind of positive. You know, yeah. like you're always going to do well even True. short term. Even if in 08 your real estate in fucking Florida crashed today, it's three x what it was back then, right? Exactly. Like, yep. So historically, you always do well. Now I knew this would happen for specifically the car market. Uh, okay. And I believe that. So okay. if I believe that, then I kept taking bets that I couldn't afford to take. Mm -hmm. And then little by little, something really interesting happened. The same people, by then I had like five investors that came in and were buying cars with me. Yeah, They started asking me a really interesting question. They said, wait a minute, can I drive one of these cars that I'm investing in? And okay. I said, well, no, well, that would defeat the purpose because they're supposed to say low mileage, you're not supposed to use them, title them. You so, were renting them out? Like, how are you? No, make... no, not renting them out. They wanted to just drive one, like, but because I had a dealer license to uh -huh. basically put a like tag on it. Okay. And they were like, well, I'll just drive that. But you were to... selling them, is how you were making Well, I wasn't or... selling them yet. I was just <laughs> okay. collecting them. So okay. I had these cars right. in a warehouse, okay. right? I no, no selling back and forth. The goal was to sell them, but at the time, still nobody was buying them. Okay. So, so the argument right. was I was holding these cars, and people were like, my, the, the guys that were investing with me, they were like, hey, lend me a car so I can go out on the weekend. So I started realizing, I said, no, I won't do that because I'll destroy the model. Why don't I sell you a car oh. out of my inventory? And basically, I'll take the profit up front. I was very honest about him, but I will sell it again for you down the road. So, oh. so you don't have to deal with like losing money. His exit strategy. Yeah, exactly. So like the Powerful. hard part is selling and you're afraid, but you want to drive it. So in order to not jeopardize my model, 
I will sell you one of the cars, right? But gotcha. at a profit, so I'll put profit in the business. Yeah. But in exchange, basically, I will handle the sales, so you don't have to worry about like as long as you don't crash it. If you crash it, you're fucked. You're okay. So they don't lose really. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't a loss, but I yeah. was like, you just can't do it where you just take a car, you know, because gotcha. then you're jeopardizing what I'm doing. Okay. And basically, right when you buy a car from a dealership, what happens? You buy the car, the more you go, you go up the lot, loses value. But you're saying not all cars, but some, some cars, yes, regular cars. Okay. But there's other cars, you can pretty much take that car. The but... right cars will go up in value from there. Okay. Yeah. So right. in a nutshell, they're taking the cars from, from him, right? But at the end of the day, they can take it back to him. He'll sell it for them. That's a okay. big W because selling cars is tough sometimes. Yeah. So you take, you assume all the risk. So what exactly. happened next? Exactly. Yeah. So, so what happened next? So I figured out that within my business, I had an opportunity to have a concierge business, basically, where I provided people with these cars. And they could do that. So basically, I would teach them how to basically buy the cars, mm -hmm. and they would buy from my inventory. They would drive it, and then they would be basically bringing the car back when they're ready, and they would switch. But every time, profiting for the business. So the business was never jeopardized because your friends were like, "Let me get some because I'm an investor here." You know, yeah. you know, there's people that invest a hundred grand in something and they believe they're the owner. You know, they walk yeah, around like they got course. a big dick or something. Mm -hmm. They don't. They're not doing any other work, right? Yeah. So I was telling people, I was like, "We're not doing that shit. Like, you're not fucking what you don't own shit. Mm -hmm. You basically have inventory here, like basically in this cars." If you want to take them, you want to deal with it, it's your inventory and take it. But if you go my way, we make money my way. Not I got an idea and I'm changing your business model. People agreed with it. It was fine. I had this concierge business, but I still didn't have heavy cash flow. And then I learned something really interesting. I saw the rise on the internet of watches. Mm. And that changed my entire business model. Okay. Because now I basically realized that they go hand to hand. Mm -hmm. So I started getting in the watch business very, very early. And that became a significant... What year is this now? Are we in 08 at this point? We're in 09. Okay. So 08 has already Recession. happened. Yeah, like it's 09. And I'm seeing watches start appearing everywhere for sale. You know, and I had a friend, that I had a guy I knew from a car forum. He was selling watches and his life kept getting better. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> in the middle of a recession, like this guy's buying more cars. As I'm looking and I'm like, what does he do? He owns a fucking watch business. So I investigate that. It's not even a watch business like out of a studio, just selling watches. But he's buying like his own personal Lamborghini, Porsche and shit. I'm like, okay, so he's doing well, you know, mm -hmm. in the latest. So I was like, okay, let me learn about that. And so I started, I bought a watch from him to learn how he basically. What did you buy? I bought a shitty Panerai. It was like three grand just okay. to learn. And at the time it was a big deal because remember, uh, back then, right? Like mm -hmm. a three grand watch is the equivalent of a 15, 20 grand watch today. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. The watch game wasn't on point, yeah. you know, like it wasn't like what it is today. Yep. So, and watches weren't going for 500% of MSRP. Oh. Oh. If you don't kill me with your water. <laughs> and what are you wearing right now? Huh? What are you wearing right uh, now? This is an RM55 uh, Bubba Watson. How much so, do those go for uh, on the market? They, they originally were 100, about 100K new. Now they go for about 300 grand. So so you bought your first watch for 3K. Now you're wearing... Well, now I have a two and a half million dollar watch collection, but completely separate from anything I sell. It's like completely on, like my personal watch collection that I don't gotcha. do anything with. Like that I wear... Still, still retains value, yeah. goes up in value, but not like personally trying to sell. It. Yeah, yeah, you're just your personal. Yeah, collection. like meaning, yeah, just like my cars now, I have about 15 million in cars, personal cars that are mm -hmm. not for sale, and then I floor plan another dozen dealerships with cash and opportunities to buy and sell cars. Cool. But, so you're in a watch game now. You purchase your first mm -hmm. piece for three thousand after watching your friend who's a watch dealer making money, mm -hmm. and then what happened? Well, then I started incorporating watches, and I realized there's a huge need for watches, and watches are a huge thing that basically turn 20, 25, 30% ROI, mm. but they don't have paperwork, meaning like they don't have titles. Ah, they don't have to go through all the things, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, this is a new thing, right? Like, and it's exciting. And the main thing about watches that really excited me about it was the time frame. Like a transaction in real estate is a 30 day time frame. Like yeah. you, you have to go through, even if you yeah. can do it wholesale, there's yeah, still residential paperwork. and assuming that you exactly. even got it. Assuming point. you have a guy on day one and yeah. everything's good. 30 right? If you're good on, on a car deal, it's like five to 10 days by title. Some states 20, whatever. But yeah. if you're a deal license and you have to go through all the tax process, you know, and so on and so forth. Well, a watch is 30 seconds. You wire me. You can literally wear my watch now and walk out of the building. I'll ship you the box of papers. Boom. You know? Exactly. Yep. It's like instant. So the transaction speed was so, so fast. Very true. That it was just unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so did you start doing a similar business model where you were purchasing these watches and almost having them in a lot similar to your vehicles and just selling them? Or So I started, no. So at the time, we weren't doing anything with investing in watches. We were just buying watches, selling watches. Okay. So basically, we became a full 
jewelry store, you know, like selling like okay. basically watches to people. And what mainly, pieces were you getting? Like, were you getting Rolexes? Were you getting everything from AP, Rolex, Paddock? Also at the time, same thing, Panerai, Hublots, even the stuff that wasn't too popular like today is like the only, you know, holy grail of watches. But yeah. back then, anything I could get my hands on that was a good brand, I would get, I would flip, I would make a quick two, three, five K margin. But I realized this flip game was making me really heavy revenue really fast. Gotcha. And so as cars were selling, right, uh -huh. and I was moving, like, I started moving cars, 10%, 12% margins, I was like, well, okay, good enough, get rid of it, reinvest that money in watches now so we can flip them and actually get more clients because these are bringing in more money faster. Okay. So I started creating real revenue for these things, then I started offering concierge service for travel and all these things. So all of this put together, now we had a full concierge service, mm -hmm. and we were catering to people that would come in. I wanted to invest in a car. Mm -hmm. And then we created a new investment model, which was really cool. As I started getting more money and I could buy more expensive cars, like million dollar Enzos and things like that, mm -hmm. I started bringing people together. And I was like, how about four of you mm -hmm. buy one car together? Mm. You know, 250, 250. And I'll yeah. take the fourth position, for example. So I take one position, you take a position, he takes a position. When we sell, I'll get my transaction fee at the beginning when I set up the deal. I'll get a transaction fee at the end. And whatever I sell above that number is mine to keep, basically. Okay. And that became a huge part of our revenue because we were buying so many cars in the distress time uh -huh. that we were getting allocations for really incredible cars, like upcoming. You mm -hmm. know, and as the recession was ending and people were starting to spend money, I started realizing that this was basically my business model. But it was flawed. Mm. It was flawed for two reasons. It couldn't survive 10, 15 years later. It wasn't scalable. And it was one big problem. It was huge, huge margins. Like meaning we had to take a $300,000 liability on a car. Mm. Yeah. And in many cases, I was lucky if by the end of the whole year, after all my hard work and all this dollar in inventory, I was taking home 700K, a million bucks. And I thought that was fucked. Yeah. I was like- Yeah, because you're the one taking all the risk because you're the one yeah. guaranteeing to sell it. And one mistake yeah. could have cost a third of my income, right? Yeah. So fucked, like completely fucked. Mm -hmm. So I started kind of looking ahead and I was like, completely fucked. Okay. But what I started doing was back then I knew the internet would be something like way bigger for education. Yeah. And I was like, this you before know, before social media guys. Yeah. Yeah. This is way before. Way yeah, before yeah. Yeah. There was a time on Instagram where I was fucking like literally jerking off to make an eight grand a day just because I was selling courses on Instagram, you know, like, yeah. and it was like without even any paid ads, you know, it was just wow. like, yeah, okay. so it was a good time. But the, the main thing was I decided, I said, you know, what is really, really Exciting is when people learn that what they wanted to do was basically get into these cars. Like my clients wanted to get in and out of these cars. And that was the number one thing that attracted people. How do I buy a car and not lose money? Okay. So I decided to basically teach finance that way. And that's when exotic car hacks. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny, work. right? When I first came to America, I was at Starbucks studying real estate, YouTube, Instagram, right? Social media. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, okay, cool. How do I become successful, you know, successful at YouTube, Instagram, you know, Facebook, whatever. Then I saw what year guy, is this? This is like 2016? 2015, okay. right? So I'm at Starbucks chilling one day, right? I see a guy pull up in a Lamborghini, a hot chick. I think it was like a, um, might have been a Gallardo or, or, or a Hurricane. I can't remember what it was. Probably a, a Gallardo. Anyway, it was a drop top. He pulls up. I'm like, how did he get this car? Like, I'm new to America. He's in a Lambo. Why can't I have one? So I ask him, hey, bro, what do you do for a living? So I do real estate. I'm like, damn. Okay, so learn real estate. So I go, I go to my computer, type in YouTube real estate. Learn that stuff, right? I, I'm not, I'm looking at a bunch of videos, real estate, business, and a year video comes up. It's about car hacks, and I'm like, hold on, I can get a car from a dealership legally by stealing it. How does that work? And then look like, at your, your videos over time, and I'm like, damn, he's teaching guys how to get cars that are exotic cars for pretty much like dollar cost. I'm like, how's this possible? I get the course, go to his workshop, and we meet for the first time in Full Auto mm -hmm. at Yolo. At Yolo, I'm talking to him. He seems pretty legit. I'm like, damn, this guy's serious. He knows his stuff. I want to learn. And then later on, you know, we, we kept that communication open, took me for riding in the car. And you said you were making a bunch of money from the from the course. And I was like, how is this possible? But how much were you making back then? I think maybe like 2005, six. So in, no, it no, was 2000, sorry, it was 2000. 20. Yeah, it, yeah, 20. 2020? Or 2020, 2019, somewhere like around there. So how much money were we making? Yeah, okay, compared so, to zero. Okay, so in 2019, we were roughly a $15 million digital business. Like wow. my digital, Companies yeah. were making collectively. I was selling courses on business, yeah. courses on watches, watch trading, and courses on car hacking. Okay. And at the time, that was roughly the size of our portfolio. Today, it's roughly 35 million. 
Nice. So yeah. over the last three years, it's grown significantly because people have been wanting to learn about watches and cars more than ever, right? So, so. your expertise is teaching people to get a vehicle, right, for on the low and be able to drive it for a bit and then be able to sell it on the high. So that's wishful that thinking because you have okay. to actually use the vehicle in between, which means you're changing the dynamics of the car. Okay. Like meaning you're adding that's miles, what I mean when right? I said you're drive using it. A bit. it. Yeah. It could get damaged, rock trip, whatever. You're yeah. using it. You're going out. As a result of that usage and time depreciating too, the fact that it's one year older or a year later, you still have to have that formula to basically anticipate where will the value be in a year after I drive it? Uh -huh. What will the value be with the additional miles I put on it? Mm -hmm. You know, and the condition deteriorating, mm -hmm. where am I going to be able to exit at the same dollar amount? Okay. So I basically teach you the ins and outs of where you have a, a 10, per, like basically a 10% gap of risk to being able to drive a car yeah. and exit with the lowest risk possible. So most people don't drive exotics because they think they're making a $200,000 purchase. Yeah. So they go, I gotta pay 200 grand for this. Like, yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. But they don't, what if I told you that your risk factor is only 20 grand? Could you mm. part away with driving a Lamborghini for a whole year for 20 grand? Cause you can uh -huh. rent one for a day for two grand yeah. or you can own one for an entire year for 20 grand. Uh -huh. If you think that's your worst case scenario, then would you not buy it? Uh -huh. You know, like, because you probably have 20 grand of disposable money, probably don't have 200 grand to lose. Yeah. yeah. So because if you start changing. And this is over a year for all, all those like wondering like, oh, 20 for grand. Over I, yeah, for over yeah. a year. Yeah. Some of y'all might spend that on fucking bitches that don't like you anyway. Exactly. Bottle, that's, like, uh, you know, bottle, that's one vacation over overseas. You know, like yeah. that. that's the argument. So like, yeah. between your flights and even over if you use points and, you know, the hotel okay. shit or the food, you're like spending 20 grand for like a week okay. in a foreign country versus for an entire year on okay. your car and driving. Right. So. Okay. If you start to reshape the way you change your mind mm -hmm. towards money mm -hmm. and understand these concepts, then you start to not be a pussy about spending it because okay. you realize you're re-leveraging it. Uh -huh. You're taking a 200K car mm -hmm. and you're basically parking 180 grand, risking 20 grand. Okay. Do you understand so, that? And also, completely. opportunity so, costs because when you get that car, doors open up. Yes, you can I mean, network, business, networking, business, and everything in between. Like you, people don't... A lot of conversations point. are had when a certain car pulls up. Yeah, exactly. So I was just going to say that those cars, bro, like just having them in your like garage or even having them when you go out to car show opens up many doors for you. I mean, it opens up doors everywhere. The, the idea that people want to network with broke people is just retarded. Like, yeah. no, no, I mean, nobody wants to do that. Like, yeah, nobody true. wants to do that. Like, it says something now. And even cars can be fake, right? You can also like rent them, lease them and show up. Yeah. But there's a different demeanor to someone that owns, you know, a 300K car, a million dollar car, a three million dollar car to someone who's just renting a car. So. PJ, let me ask you this then. Mm -hmm. Someone like me, right? I'm not a car guy myself, but I understand the power that it holds because I see what Fresh does with his, right? For the average viewer here that might be making, you know, maybe fifty, hundred thousand dollars a year, somewhere in that range, and they want to get into this where they can drive an exotic car and be able to turn a profit, mm -hmm. how would they go about it? Well, first off, they have to understand the power of credit leverage. So they have to understand how credit plays a role if you don't have cash. Credit is key. So important. Credit's key. Like yep. that's that's part of the game, right? Mm -hmm. Then you also have to understand like the values of cars. So you okay. can go through exotic car hacks to course learn about cars. Uh -huh. It's easier if you somewhat like cars. If mm -hmm. you don't know what the fuck the difference is between a Huracan and an Aventador, it's probably not going to do very well yeah. for you. You know, like yeah. you're like, I want the one that doors go up. It's probably not a good. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. probably not a good yeah. angle. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so otherwise, you end up like uh, that guy with a Boxster. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I got a first Boxster. <laughs> <laughs> so um understand credit which is critical to all other asset classes yeah. anyway yeah um and then having a knowledge of cars of course so that you don't get finessed and, and, and you then... also have to level yourself up this is the part that most people don't realize they go oh man i saw fresh have an svj i want an svj well mm. what the fuck do you drive now i drive a kia yeah, it's probably uh, that, that's yeah. like it's yeah. like i want a 30 million dollar mansion too on my first fucking try right yeah. 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 it's not a high worst step to it yeah so a lot of times people play the game of life short term like yeah. they go like, I want now, I do now, whatever it costs. They go put themselves in financial burdens. They're like, oh, I can afford 20 grand a month. I'm going to buy this. They don't really think she's true. This is a long term game. Okay. So what does that mean? That means if you don't have a, you have a 5K car today, a 20K car today, no problem. Get yourself a 60K car. Okay. Go from a 60K car using the same strategy. You don't have to lose money. Go to the 100K car. Okay. You, you don't have a problem. Go to 150K car, you okay. know, and leverage Increase your credit and also increase who you become. You were talking earlier about character. Like when you make money, you become Trust. a person, a character, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And it's the same thing with, with cars. Like if you go first day in an SVJ, one, you don't know how to drive it. Not mm. saying you're going to crash because it's too fast, but rather 
you're going to hit bumps with your front bumper. That's an $18,000 fucking problem. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like, you're going to give it to the valet. That's a fucking $5,000 problem every other fucking day. Mm-hmm. Like, so you don't know how to do that because you're not in that world. So mm-hmm. get in that world and play long term, like one car at a time. Mm-hmm. It's just like you don't start your game with like a 300K watch. Why, why don't you do that? Because you're going to walk into the hood in mm-hmm. the wrong place. Of or you're going to get drunk. Something's going to happen. And then, boom, you know, 300K is worth killing someone over. Like, yeah. you fucking can't even rob a bank at 300K. You yeah, know, like, yeah. so... So, okay. So let's say, um, so we understand these basic concepts of getting your credit on point, understanding that you got to scale up. You can't start mm-hmm. at a Lamborghini SVJ. You're probably going to have to start lower and work your way. So what is the entry car uh, for someone to go ahead and procure and start this strategy? I mean, you can start with BMW M powers. You can start with AMGs. You can start with seven series. You can okay. start with S classes, you know, S 600 is a popular car. So yeah. Miami, whatever you can start there. You can even do an old world choice. You know, okay. if you're like, there are goes, how much money yeah, do you exactly. need? The yo, poor man's want to be fucking like, yo, yeah. guess guys in the chat. <laughs> I want you to guess, right? <laughs> guys, do it right on the chat. How much is the Rolls Royce goals right now? Do you think like this would be a thousand percent? Sorry, go ahead. So, um, they go ahead and procure one of these cars. How much are they going to need for the average guy out there that might be watching that want, wants to get into this? If a normal person is a 650 credit score yeah, and has had some kind of normal credit is not just completely fucked, yeah. you know, like they're going to be able to get into a car with five to 10% down okay. on their first car mm-hmm. until they can eventually level up their credit. Then they'll be able to buy 500K cars with zero down. But okay. until they can do that, as their credit increases, Flip et cetera. Admin. 300K, 500K. Yeah, but this is why most people are poor, right? Because yeah, most yeah. people think, well, most people don't understand money. That's why they're poor. Like mm. most people see things they don't <laughs> understand. This is true. I'm telling you, dude. Like you see so many people in Miami wearing <laughs> fucking ghetto ass watches with fake ass diamonds on them. And, and you're like, oh, like that guy's rich. He's rich. Yeah, 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 he's fucking rich. <laughs> you got a $5,000 nope. watch that's like been put some fake fucking diamonds. You don't even know anything about it. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is you perceive money and that's how you fucking lose, right? Mm-hmm. Per- your view of money is the reason why you don't get rich. Mm-hmm. Damn. So you have to look at money and understand it if you're going to be someone that actually has money. You can't be like, oh, my Lamborghini dream is a million dollars away. No, it's not. Your Lamborghini dream is like $1,200 a month away. hmm like, mm. you're not fucking glorifying the guy driving down the street if you knew he paid $1,200 a month for his fucking car. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right? Like, you don't glorify it. That's yeah. not fucking glorifiable. But yet, people go and suck that guy's dick. Like, oh, teach me business. The fuck is he going to teach you? Yeah. It's, like, a, what, what it's is, a car payment. Yeah. It, it's, it's not exciting. Yeah. It's not special. Like, yeah. And what I'm saying is this is the number one reason why the internet is so good, right? Because people can hide all these things. On, on the just the perceived value of things, and most people don't. So continue. how much is it really? Can you tell them how much it's going crazy? Royce. <laughs> so you can buy you can buy a Rolls Royce Ghost as lo- a clean quality Rolls Royce Ghost, not a salvage fucked up car, whatever, for a hundred to a hundred ten k. That's and, it. Wow. And that will cost you. This is the worst part. You can get loans that'll cost you eight hundred to nine hundred bucks a month. Wow. That's it. Rolls Royce, you got one. Because I saw people putting in like 400, 500K, and et cetera. Nah. So I have, I have the most expensive, the same one that we basically saw in my warehouse. Yeah. It's that, in the blog, car, guys. that car is 550 grand. That mm-hmm. is as high as a ghost will come. Like mm-hmm. the newest, latest, fuck you, highest option possible car, mm-hmm. 550 grand. That's the new shit, right? Mm-hmm. That's not what people should be buying if they're starting in this. You know, like that's yeah. what they want. They see it. They're like, oh my God, that's hot as shit. Like it's got shooting stars and this and that. But that's not how it works, right? Like um, you get there over time, right? Yeah. When I was big at the beginning, I wasn't buying half a million dollar cars that were depreciating 300K, you know, and then being like, oh, I can take a 200K loss, whatever. But today I can take write-offs of over 200K, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I can do things that I couldn't do when I didn't have money. Gotcha. So so there's a different game to play at all levels. And that's one of the things I'm trying to say. And guys, the course is actually down below in, in the description box. But punch them real quick. Someone says to me all the time, yo, bro, the guy PJ, is that course real? What do you say to that? Again, a reality so disconnected for people mm-hmm. that it's too good to be true, yeah. right? Like it, it's again, they don't understand money. So if you tell someone from zero to Rolls Royce, they go from zero to 500K, you're full of shit. There you go. That's the answer to why people don't understand. But if you tell someone, hey, I'm going to show you basically how to get a Rolls Royce for $800 a month. That doesn't make any sense. You're lying. What are you going to do? Like rent it out? Or do I need to go like uh, pay with another guy? Like, they don't understand money. So to them, it's so discontinued, like it's so far from their reality in their thoughts. And so, so that's my number one advice to people. If you want to make money and learn money, 
stop denying what you don't understand about money and start investigating and learning instead of discarding the things that aren't in your scope you know, of understanding. You know what helped me? Seeing you with so many cars, I was like, I just need one car. I don't care right. about having all those cars. If he has 20, 10, 20 cars, I just need one car. Mm -hmm. So focus on making the money so you can get at least one car. And you're right. What's, what, see what's possible with the money makes all the difference. Um, you, I mean, you have to. You yeah. don't have a chance. So going back to that example, uh, so you were saying, so people that are starting out, get that 650 credit score. You can start, and then you can start getting into the game with, you were saying S-Classes, Mercedes, AMGs, BMWs. And M -powers, yeah. Okay, so... Even Maseratis, like Maserati. two Maseratis okay. for like wow. 60 grand. So how much do they need to start to get into this at this point for these vehicles that you mentioned at a beginner level? Really not that much. There's people that if you have good credit, you can probably get in with two to three K. If wow. you're okay. like, that's yeah. it. Like it's not that heavy. If you have average credit, you might need to put more cash to get okay. in a 50, 60 K car. So let's say they go ahead and get an S class and they put, you know, 650 credit score. Mm -hmm. They might have to put down, you're saying what, maybe 5K? Yeah, 5, 6K. Well, should they look for a car that's 2023 or should they look no, for a never. car? No, never. So you, like in the course, we teach you specifically what years, specific models. It doesn't work with all S classes. Okay. So you yeah. just go, oh, I want an S550. That's the one I want. It doesn't yeah. work that way. So you have to actually, the better the car, the more likely you get a better return. So if you buy an S63 AMG that's way more expensive, or an S65 E12, or even an S600 Maybach, you're going to get way better returns than if you get an S550 and lose your ass on it. So the main concept here is to know which cars to buy, uh -huh. what years, which is usually we look at your cars that are three to four years old, right about to come off a of warranty that have extended warranty for a year or two, so you don't have to worry about the maintenance and that shit. Yeah. And then basically can drive that car for the duration of a year. And that's it. And then can, basically get out. You can add roughly 5,000 miles or so if you buy it with our principles and then get out. Nice. <laughs> so for, can you, if you can, yeah. can you walk us through one example mm -hmm. from beginning to end of a car to get and how to go about it? Just so the audience kind of knows, sure. hey, like, this is a cap. Why don't we use an, why don't we use an S63 like yeah, example? Because you go just ahead. brought that up, right? Yeah. So you buy, for example, a 2015 okay. S63 AMG mm -hmm. with 25, roughly 1,000 miles. Mm -hmm. You can find that on the internet somewhere around 70K. Okay. Asking. Mm -hmm. You negotiate down to 60. Uh -huh. Historically, that car has been 60 to 80 for the last three and a half years. Okay. So it hasn't really moved in price. Mm -hmm. So that's how you know it's a hack. Uh -huh. Get it? Like because, it holds value well. Right. Look for vehicles no, because that it has value. already depreciated based on time. Gotcha. And and because of that time depreciation has already taken its place, you're not fighting time anymore. So it Bam. doesn't matter if you keep it a year. Okay. The other argument is then you Smart. find specifically the set of options I tell you, which enable you to, for example, in this case, the right carbon options, all the specific uh, carbon fiber on the exterior, carbon fiber interior, you get like night vision, all these packed shit, like maybe matte paint. You find specifically hotter cars okay. that are well specced. Gotcha. Because they're so far and few in between. Gotcha. So they depreciate even less because everybody wants them. Oh. Then you drive it a year and you bought it. Let's say the average car on the on the market at that time, like has basically between twenty to thirty thousand miles. You find a car that has twenty two thousand miles or twenty three, and you negotiate it down from a dealer that basically doesn't want that car in their lot. Gotcha. You then take that car and then drive it. And instead of that dealer making that profit, you drive that profit away. So a year later, whatever you were selling your car at with the extra miles is now today's retail price. Yeah. Okay. And so then, now you get rid of it. Let's say you bought it for like 68. Mm -hmm. You get rid of it for, let's say, 65. You okay. drove it a little bit. Maybe yeah. you banged up the wheels, whatever, right? Yeah. You lost three grand. You divide three grand into 12 months. You basically paid like, what, like 250 bucks? Mm -hmm. A month to drive a hundred eighty thousand dollar car. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Would you rather drive an S sixty three MG two door coupe or would you rather drive a Volkswagen Jetta or a Rabbit? <laughs> or, or yeah, like how much pussy are you gonna get with a Volkswagen Rabbit? <laughs> like, yeah. Like what I'm saying is like mm -hmm. you don't even have to be that rich, right? That's just the that's the how you hack the system and get the vehicle. Yeah, yeah, I mean there's a lot of moving parts there as well in yeah. the course, but like that's the gist of it. But okay. the extra strategy is important. Wealthy, like rich people are yeah. doing this forever. Like yeah. this is not like, oh, I just, I've been doing this for fucking ever. But like rich people before me were doing this shit with yachts and whatever else. Yeah. It's basically buying the goods that people want that they know are in short supply. Uh huh. Just like in your life, greatness is in short supply. Great cars are in short supply. Everything that's great is in short supply. So basically people are able to get the car with fairly little down and mm -hmm. then being able to sell it back at Equal, if not maybe or slightly, even, yeah, uh, slightly even more, slightly less, whatever. Now you said before, the better the car, 
the higher the likelihood you'll actually be able to return a profit when you sell yeah, it back. Yeah, exactly. Because if it's Obviously super it's hot, a beginner, yeah, so. if it's super hot and exclusive, then it's going to bring more than what other cars are bringing on the market. Gotcha. So because as starting out, break even, and then as you get be better, as you at get it. better in the game, the cost of money becomes cheaper, right? Because you're borrowing at better rates. You have more experience. There you, you go. Know, like okay. you, you create a network around you who fixes the car, who doesn't. You know, like all these things come to play. Yeah. Gotcha, so even gotcha. if you're new into the car game and you're like, hey, I've never been, kind of been into cars, the argument isn't should you buy an expensive car or not. The argument is even if you don't want a Ferrari or Lamborghini, like maybe your lifestyle doesn't really dictate it. Mm -hmm. Well, why not have like an S class instead of a Jetta? Like if it costs the same or less, gotcha. then what's no, why, why not? not? Like why not? Exactly. And you just sold the McLaren, uh, the mm -hmm. one with the blue seats, right? Um, so tell us a little bit about that because that was definitely a different spec. Uh, did you make money in that one? Did you lose money in that one? I bought that car at the highest peak of the market, mm -hmm. at the highest possible dollar amount, and everybody said I would lose a ton of money, but I ended up driving the car for like about five months or so, and I added miles to it because I used it. It was like about a thousand miles or so after five months, and then I just got rid of it and made exactly my money plus four grand. Wow. And, and this was, this was, this is the worst part. Bought at the worst time of the market before the crash. Yeah. Sold in the middle of a crash uh -huh. and still got all more money plus profit. And so that's, that's the power why of buying hot cars at the higher level. The right cars, the right even cars. if they're not the most expensive cars and okay. so on and so forth. Like, listen, it's it's more a money game that it's a car game. Got we right. just use cars as like as part of this gig. It's the same as it. like watches, cars, everything else. It's the same shit. What are the top, let's say three cars or five if you have more that hold value well? I mean, every, today, like Ferraris generally do better than other makes. If they're okay. newer Ferraris, they always do well. Uh, Rolls Royce Bentley will always crash no matter what. There's okay. two masters, doesn't matter. Like they will always go down unless you buy them already depreciated. Gotcha. Uh, I think that value holding, I mean, hypercars will always do better because they're again short supply. It's a supply. What's a hypercar? Like million dollar plus okay. MSRP. Okay. You know, like okay. they're because they're short supply, they're limited edition, et cetera. Yeah, Those, Pagani, 918s, Bugatti, stuff like that just holds better. Bugatti. But, yeah, Bugatti. in general, I would say that uh, like Ferrari models mm -hmm. do better because they're more stable. Today, Lamborghini models also do fantastic. Okay. A lot more, not base Huracans and shit that poor people drive. <laughs> I'm talking about like, <laughs> you know, I'm the talking brokies. About, <laughs> the brokies. It's not, it's not, it's not the brokies. It's, it's the guys, you know, what I, what I have a problem with isn't people that drive Huracans. Everybody's entitled to rise up the ladder. There's, yeah, there's yeah, no, of course. everybody should, doesn't matter. The, the main problem is people that want to pretend they can do something they can't. Like, okay. I, I got a guy with a fucking Corvette that's like, oh, yeah, I bought a Corvette because it's a better proposition than a fucking McLaren. On what fucking planet? Like, why would that be better? The only reason he bought a Corvette is because he can't afford a McLaren. Yeah. If you were in a position to buy a McLaren, you wouldn't fucking buy a Corvette. You might buy a McLaren and a Corvette, like you mm. want to drive a Corvette, every, but you ain't fucking not got a McLaren, but you got a Corvette. Like, mm. So the problem is I had Mustangs when I was poor. Like, uh, I wasn't rich. Uh, I was okay. And and I wasn't fucking trying to race Ferraris to be like, hey, my Mustang's faster than your Ferrari. Mm -hmm. Motherfucker, you drive a Ferrari. I'm driving a Mustang. You won the race before we even started the race. <laughs> that, that's the argument. It's the same as if you got a guy with, like, three chicks in the car. Yeah. And, you're like, you're by yourself holding your dick in your hand in your fucking car. It doesn't matter what. You lost. You, <laughs> you lost the race, right? Yeah. They, they won. But doesn't Peshman, matter. Corvettes are 60K. I can get one for 60K. Yeah, you and, the, and the value's so good. It goes just as fast as your fucking Ferrari. <laughs> and this doesn't fucking matter. Nobody drives a Ferrari because it's running circles around a Corvette or not. We don't give a shit. Like, mm -hmm. But the Corvette people care because that's all they have to hang on to. Mm. Okay. And Peshman, you did a Netflix series called Fastest Car, right? Mm -hmm. And you were there. And listen, man. World-class asshole. I was know. rooting for you. 100%. But you lost the Honda Civic. Tell yes. us about, about that experience, bro. Well, first off, that was an illegal race because they told us we were going to race street legal cars. Mm. There was nothing street legal about three of those cars. Mm. Like those three cars had fake tags on them, which is okay. Like, listen, it was a good show. You know, I'm fucking made 800 grand from it. Everyone else went home poor, right? <laughs> so nice. I won the show. I didn't need to win a fucking race. <laughs> the argument, though, is the, the, the argument with the Civic versus the nice cars mm. is really simply put is this. If you can afford, let's say, a, a million dollar car, a 500K car, and a Civic races you and beats you, well, you could have bought that Civic, built it too, and burned it to the fucking ground five times over. Okay, you chose not to. You bought a 500K car. Can the Civic guy buy the 500K car? The answer is no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so so it, it's, it's a worthless race. Like, it doesn't matter. Now, did I get my ass handed to me by the fastest Honda Civic in the country? Yes. Mm. 
Was it even possible to win a race? No, it was a seven second car. There is no stock exotic in the fucking world that runs seven seconds except the new Rimac. That wasn't even out then. So it's a lost race. Like yeah, it, it's, it, impossible. It's, like, it's impossible. Like you fucking don't defy the laws of physics when you race people. Like you don't fly. So the argument was that wasn't a race that was going to be won. My victory came from realizing that how incredible TV can be because I had been on a couple of shows before and I was like, oh, drama heats up the shit. So I have the most watched episode. That mm -hmm. episode leads to the most Google searches. That Google search ends up being sales. So the argument was everybody came there with their pride. I left with 800 grand in sales. That's a bitch and happy. W. And that's the victory. Like basically whatever, the, the performance I took there was 350 grand. I basically bought three of them by the time I left, right? Like, so I was like, okay, fuck it. Like that was it. Was it a good show? Fantastic. Is it still incredibly? They put me on the cover of the fucking season. So because it was the most watched episode. So it, it was exciting and it was cool, you know? But he who laughs last laughs hardest. Bam. That, that's the argument, right? Yeah. And if you live life for the shitty expectation that, like, that's what matters, then you unfortunately just, you know, like, you, I mean, they, they're still poor, right? That's the argument. <laughs> I mean, like, fuck, I know those guys. I follow them on social. They're still all broke. Like, nothing has changed. You wrote an article about 10 things that poor people do to make them stay poor. What inspired you to write that article? I fight oh, poverty. Things. I, I, <laughs> things. I, I fight poverty because I fucking hate it. I hate justification for poverty. Mm. People call me an asshole, but you just can't say shit and then, like, like people, I don't, I don't know what it is with people. Like, they just don't like to be attacked. And, and, and here's, here's how, why people feel attacked. I, I've come, and I do a lot of work on philosophy, psychology, and human awareness, so I'll tell you this. You wrote a book too. Yeah, a lot of books, but three of them are more famous than the other ones. The argument is this, it's really simple. If you don't have a plan, you feel attacked. Fair if enough. you don't have a path, you're attacked. If I called you poor, and you're on your way, you go, yes, I'm poor, but I won't be. So it's okay. Fair enough. Mm. If you're fat and you're at the gym, you're highly overweight. You're at the gym working out. Someone walks by you and you're like, hey, you're fat. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I'm fucking here, right? I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. be fat. Yeah. yeah. I'm not offended. That's, that's just a, a reality I have to face. Now, I mean, I like it, but it's still a reality I live through. Yeah. The people that get attacked are the people that genuinely don't have a path to what the attack is on. Wow. Gotcha. So if Good you point. attack someone in an MLM, right, like a multi-level marketing company, no marketing. you're attacking their livelihood because they're unemployable. They don't know how to get a real job. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh, fuck. And they don't know how to build a company. So they're basically in the middle of that ground where they're basically like, oh, well, this is my livelihood. So if you attack the MLM and I agree with you, well, I don't have a path out of this. So I I'm going to fight you, even though there's all this evidence <laughs> that I'm fucking completely like full of shit, it doesn't matter because it basically will count against you. So that is how basically like people feel offended. So if I call someone poor, we're all poor respectively. Like I'm, I mean, I fucking hang out with people. I have $300 million yachts. Like, yeah, you know, like it's like fucking insanity. You know, like I, I don't have a fucking $300 million, but I, when I'm next to him, I feel poor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but I don't feel attacked. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, I'm on a path. I have these companies. One it of should them. inspire you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You should get excited about it. That fucking guy was capable of doing this. That's exciting, right? Like, I when I was poor, I saw a guy fucking walk in with a, a Modena and a fucking uh, uh, gold Rolex. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't have fucking 30 grand. This guy's wearing 30 fucking grand on his wrist. Yeah. And I think to myself, I'm like, how amazing that there is a person that I can talk to right now that is wearing a watch that is more than my entire worth. I find that fascinating. Like, I'm like, this is beautiful. Yeah. It's not about glorifying the watch. Yeah. It's about the ideology that that person figured that shit out, right? He's yeah. not struggling like I was. Yep. And so the first thing I'd want to do, I paid a guy $100 to be like, hey, like, let's talk. What, what the fuck? Like, how did you get here? Yeah. I didn't have the internet or Instagram or 100 bullshit yeah. ways to find yeah, you out. You got to ask them. So right I was like, hey, there. Like, I'll pay you $100. When for I first them. met you, I was broke, mm -hmm. making $10 an hour at Chick fil A. But I said, you know what? If I stay around you long enough, I'll learn something. Mm -hmm. And that one day I paid for mentorship. You took me in your car for a drive, the Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. I was like, damn, it's possible. Just that one talk. And, but that's that's the key. It's yeah. once you touch the possible, mm -hmm. then, then you realize, well, if he did it, how come I can't do it? Right. Right. And But it starts with personal excellence. And that that's never going to change. Yeah. 
as long as you're not excellent at what you do, you're never going to get the confidence to basically move forward or anything. Mm -hmm. So it starts with you wash cars, be excellent at it. You, you work at the mall, be excellent at it. And, and the part that people don't realize is that you're learning how to create incredible experiences for people, no matter what you do. And, and they don't look at it that way. They're just basically just, you know, just like, oh, it's a shitty job. But it's, it's not what it is. You're learning on the job. If you are worth more than your job, then go find one that proves that you have that worth. If you don't, then fucking work. When we're in Dubai, we're around a lot of high net worth individuals. A lot. And, you know, I'm over here, like, in my head, like, oh, yeah, no, I got a couple of M's. And then I'm like, oh, wait, no, <laughs> these guys have a lot of M's. And yeah. I was like, wow, like, this and is exciting, crazy. it's exciting, right? Yeah. Like, you see what they're doing, yeah. and you're I like, at it, that's yeah. nice, instead, right? of, instead of getting mad about it and be like, oh, this guy's a boasting asshole or a jerk or whatever, because we met some very, very wealthy, successful people in Dubai. I was like, wow. I don't got shit. Royal, I'm poor. Royalty as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I'm fucking poor. I need to make more money. It doesn't matter if I'm a multimillionaire. This is not fucking enough. Because yeah. what you, you learn need to be inspired. with the more money you make, what you learn is the more leverage you have. Yeah. And, and when you see people's leverage, that's what gives you a hard on. You know, you're like, that fucking guy just did that. Like, I can't fucking do that. You know, mm -hmm. like, that's crazy. I remember when I was poor, there's a fucking friend. Of, like, I wasn't broke, but I was poor, you know, compared subjectively to my friend. He fucking, I went to his house with another friend. He's like, hey, let's just go see this guy. This dude was a car dealer. Now he's like a friend, but now I've surpassed his level. But back then I was like so inspired. He has a fucking G-Wagon. He has a turbo Porsche. You know, like he's got this new Range Rover. We go to his house because it's a beautiful fucking like $8 million house. And I'm like, mm -hmm. fuck. He takes me in his Range Rover. We drive. The restaurant's closed. They open the restaurant for him. He wow. parks in the wrong place. He gives the guy a hundred bucks to fucking let it go. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy doesn't live on other people's fucking time. Yeah. Like he lives on his experience. Yeah. And I'm like, the most beautiful thing I learned is how he controlled that experience. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, that's what I want to do. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to do you. Like, like, that's what I want. I want this leverage to park my shit wherever and tell the guy like, it's okay. Like just to make sure nothing happens to my car instead of tow my car. Right. Like yeah. just check it and I'll pay you. Oh, restaurant's closing in 15 minutes. Don't worry. Here's 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. Stay open, make us a meal. You know, we won't take too much of your time. Respectfully, we'll tip everybody on the bucks. Yeah. Like that leverage to be able to live on your term. Yeah. That's what I'm saying when I said the matrix isn't your fucking enemy, right? Like mm -hmm. it's your opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's the things that people don't pay attention to. One thing to. I've noticed about losers and people that aren't successful is they'll see someone that's successful and they'll say, why? That's bullshit. They're probably scamming. They're liars. Some because bullshit. they don't have a path themselves. Versus saying, how yeah. did they get there? And then trying to learn from that person. That's Who's going to say why and then make excuses. Winners say how and figure out how to evolve, uh, ev evade those excuses. It, because if it becomes clear that you can and you aren't doing, then you have to face the idea that you're a fuck up. Bam. Very true. That's it. And nobody that spotlight wants to, hurts. That's nobody it. wants to look in a mirror and feel like they're a fuck up. Yeah. Nobody wants to. So we put that blame externally, right? Yeah. We go, well, that guy has to be scamming. Oh, I know that guy's dad. He was a millionaire. Like, okay. Like, okay. Well, why is that better for you to believe than there's a way to get there? You believe that because if my dad was a billionaire, then that would prove why you don't have to try because you don't have a chance. There right? You like, go, yeah. like, you can just give yeah. up and say, well, I'm not, I'm, well, I wasn't made to be here. Validates right? your excuses. Exactly. Like, it, it makes you basically can, can bullshit your way through life and be like, we all get lucky. That's how the lucky ones, you know, people are like, hey, that guy uh, had some crypto. That's how he made money. Uh, first off, I fucking lost money in crypto. I never made a dollar in crypto. But the argument was that even if you did make money in crypto, mm -hmm. well, you know what? You had to play in crypto. You had to buy crypto. Part of it was luck. Part of it was skill. Some people got it. Some people build business of it. Some people reinvested it. No different than the guy that gets drafted in the NBA, right? Mm -hmm. Some people go in, they take their $50 million contract and they go, hey, I'm going to build businesses, do this silently while I'm doing that. I can't play forever. Other people go, I made 50. I'm going to go buy a $30 million house, 10 cars. And they're like, I'm broke now. I broke my knee on the second fucking season. I can't do shit. You know, and I'm like, what do I do now? I got to sell the house and take losses on everything. I paid an advisor 30% of my, like, they're just not willing to level up to that person. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where the issues are. Uh, just take away what I've learned from Pedram is that, like, for example, even when taking L's and taking losses, if you work hard enough and you stay on the, on that course, it may be a 10 year plan, but if you're still along hard long enough, you can actually take a W. And for example, let's say you don't know what, you, what you're doing, try different things. And you try different, different things in, in mm -hmm. past, and finally you found what worked for you. So I think it's, that's powerful, yeah. man. Yeah, and you failed a bunch of times and never gave up. And I think that's very important. But, a lot of people don't highlight their fails. Yeah. But, but what is the alternative? 
that, that's the argument. Like, what was I going to do? Fucking give up? And what was going to happen? Like, it, how is giving up an option? Like, yeah. how, how are you going to not make it? And that's okay. Well, it's not, right? It, because it's impossible. If you don't make it, you're still broke. Yeah. Right? Like, if you try and you don't make it, you're still broke. So yeah. I'd rather try and have a chance to make it than fucking not do shit and guarantee I'm not making it. And, and the other argument is, again, we overstate our value because we think we're more, we are worth more than our skills, which is highly inaccurate. Mm. Meaning like people go, I'm not going to a job because it pays $15 an hour. Uh, yeah. Right? Like and, and, uh, I need $30 an hour. Okay. Who set that value? <laughs> Who set the $30 an hour value? You did. Okay. Based on what fact? Based on what skill? Based on what job that paid $30 an hour? Oh yeah. My friend's earning $30 an hour. You're not your friend. <laughs> You're you. Yeah, right. Why should you make $30 an hour? Make a case for it. Well, I have skills in this, this, and that's what this industry pays. Cool. Now go get a job using the skills and convince someone that you're worth $30 an hour. Mm -hmm. If not, maybe you're only worth $18 an hour, $12 an hour, whatever mm -hmm. you're being offered because you don't have skills to match it. Yeah. And again, like we overstate our value. Like, oh, well, why would I? This is the same argument as OnlyFans, right? Or a stripper argument. Like mm -hmm. you guys always talk about women here and stuff. So it's the same argument. Once you start making money, mm -hmm. it's hard to find that value elsewhere, right? You're yeah. like, oh, I'm making 50 grand a month. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck is going to pay you 50 grand a month outside of that trade? Like, yeah. So, so you get stuck into this loop that's like basically this never ending loop where you go, even if I wanted to learn a new career, I'd have to go for fucking like eight years to make like 50 grand a month doing that, you know? Yeah. So you yeah. start looking for instant gratification models and you're constantly following back, 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 back. Yeah. Well said. Uh, Right. Okay, the chats. Yep. chats. I'll hit some of them real quick. Uh, oh. And guys, do me a favor. We got 3,400 plus y'all in here. So like Money video. Monday, bro. Uh, Fire episode. Okay, and yo, you know what? We'll kill the other streams, guys. Oh, Facebook, Twitch, and uh, Twitter. Come on over to YouTube right Is now. Only Come on over. Because um, I got a question on watches nice. uh, next. Uh, and then we got the girls here, guys. So we're going to get into the after hour show right right, uh, right after. Right. As you we're guys know, that's a three That's exciting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Neeks goes, shout out to PJ Cal and the whole gang. WTA and ECH member here. The people are going to love this. Outperforming the S&P all 2023. Okay. Uh, we got Neeks five bucks. You can punch me in the face. Just don't break my $1,000 sunglasses. The real no. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a cool. Uh, and then we got here. Mohi Media goes, the audience is in for a treat if you leave emotions out. Of it and just take in what PJ says without emotions. Shout out to Watch Training Academy and Exotic Car Shout House. out to Mohi, man. I yeah. met him at the car show as well. Good dude. Mohi's a good dude. Very good dude. It's Dutch Boy goes, How should I get a good uh, used car with tax money? <laughs> well, we kind of described it earlier. Yeah. That Chat came in. We talked yeah. about uh, guys, the S63 get example. The, get the course down below, guys. I'm telling you right now, it'll change your life. Uh, I am the Warner says, Have no fear. The Warner is here. Let's go, my brother Miner. Fresh Kip, killing it. Much love and support from your brother Warner. Appreciate you, that, bro. Warner. I modded you on FETA as well. Silvio Morales, Benjamin, are you going to get revenge on the hatchback Civic or are you going to, or you don't want to take the chance and get smoked? I think that is revenge from his 800K. Facts. <laughs> Cayman uh, M, good to have y'all back in Brickle. 304 is acting up. You know what time it is. <laughs> uh, da Daniel Johnson goes, uh, love the content, man. Y'all really out here teaching young guys to turn into alpha males and successful men. I'll never understand why anyone would see this as negative. We just watch how to become better versions. Once again, of they're, not, they're not on the right path. Jay Clip. Or they don't have a path at all. Oh. Uh, glad to have you back live. FNF, love that content. Like the video, absolutely, man. We're pumping it back out. Yep. Uh, what's your thoughts on a new 2020 to 2023 Chevy Corvette? And that's from <laughs> 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 yes, that's right. <laughs> I think you gave it already. You want to give a brief like description of what? What I think about Corvettes? Yeah, Corvette. There is nothing wrong with a Corvette if you know it's a stepping stone to a real car. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Fair he's enough. Hit that very nicely. Uh, Alman Howard, was... ten bucks. <laughs> what's the best advice you guys give? Uh, guys can give on finding a good mentor. I watch you guys all the time and read books. Honestly, I could use a good mentor. Any suggestions? Honestly, bro, like a mentor could be even reading a book, watching a video. But for the main part, if someone has value that you want to get or become a part of, like just pay to be a part of that group, bro. Like it's your money that you're going to spend on partying, you know, drinks, whatever. That's going to be dead money. But if, if you've invested in yourself, fundamentally, Benjamin, you're good to go, bro. So why not invest, invest in yourself? You got American income in the house, by the way. Shout out to him. He goes, uh, Pesman, always been a huge fan. Would love to meet you someday. I want to ask how important it is to be careful with the environments and people you surround yourself with. And does it affect the amount of money you make? 100%. I mean, yeah. if you're surrounded by individuals that know how to make money, you're always going to be around those discussions, conversations around those individuals. So important. All right. Like if you like go when on, I was in Dubai, for I example. mean, look yeah. at what people are talking about around you, right? Like yeah. if they're talking about getting drunk and getting fucked up and yeah. smashing bitches. Cool. If that's all they're talking about, like at some point you start to Stupid. reconsider like, okay, like, is that all I want to do in my life? Like, you know, versus start having real conversations about 
business wins, successes, and also belief systems are different. Like you're around your friends and you go, hey, I'm gonna make like, I'm gonna start a business and make a hundred grand my first year. They look at you like, get out of here. Like who does that? Like that's only a fairy tale. You have rich friends or friends that are in business. They're gonna be like, great. What are you doing? Let me give you advice. Like what, what part, what are you gonna do? Like, how's it gonna work? Let me help you out. So these are completely different dynamics and your friends matter. Your circles matter. Even if you at first are uncomfortable because you're the underdog in that circle, it's still better to be the underdog in a great circle than to be the top dog of a completely shitty circle that doesn't go anywhere but in the circle. Well That's said. True. By the way, yep. I want to connect you with American Income. He's an awesome guy. He does those uh, Instagram uh, interviews, a woman interview about your success. So I'll connect you after the show. Sure. No problem. Yeah, and the other thing, too, you guys got to understand is that if you're like always constantly talking about partying and girls and a bunch of bullshit, you know, drugs or whatever it is, recreational stuff, what you got to understand is that those things take away from making money. The most successful people aren't constantly chasing girls and drugs and alcohol and partying. If you're doing that, it, it, it's it's counterproductive to making money being successful. You know, most guys that are potheads are just not that successful. I hate to say it like that. You know what I mean? Like pr weed promotes lethargy and it doesn't get you on your point. So even drinking too much. Yeah. Like you got to eliminate obstacles that keep you from making money. Once you make the money, then you can go ahead and have a little bit of enjoyment, take breaks here or there. But if you're around people where all they're doing is trying to figure out the next time they're going to get high, Bro, it's L for you. Huge L. Uh, Luca Doty goes, PJ, do you still hate the Lotus Exige? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do do you? Go, go, yes, go, unfortunately, go. I'm still not a fan. It's uh, it's one of those cars that if you're really like, I, I just, listen, it's a tiny little go-kart. It's completely worthless. You can buy 10 different better cars for the money than those things. It, it's great if you want it as a track car. It's fantastic if you're like, hey, I'm using this on track. You just can drive much better things on the road every day. It's just, just unnecessary you know it's like uh do i like motorcycles or not same argument didn't graham stefan buy one of those yeah the youtuber yeah that was yeah, an interesting okay. character too i have my views on that <laughs> um <laughs> top five watches uh top five models or top five brands uh we could say models okay so and the brand favorite rms 55 and 7201 okay absolute favorite Favorite APs, Open Work uh, 41 Rose Gold and uh, Open Work uh, 41 Ceramic Black. Those are the ones that show the, gear, show the, the gears. Yeah, in yeah. The open Work means yeah. skeletonized, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, the skeleton. Yeah. Okay. Paddock 5991R uh, and Paddock uh, 5981R, just both Rose Gold full bracelet watches. Yep. Fantastic watches. And then one other that I really like a lot, Paddock 5968 Green Khaki, like just a white gold, more understated. You know, less questions asked if you're mm -hmm. going places. And you Rolex, know, you're, you don't rock, don't so like Rolexes. So I like or? Rolexes from an investment standpoint. Like okay. I have a bunch of Daytonas, they do well, but mm -hmm. historically, I don't really like wearing them. Like okay. I feel poor wearing them. You buy. <laughs> so you, so you. Um, <laughs> it's just we trying to no, say, no, no, bro. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, um, so you like them more because they hold value. Uh, what What are the top Rolexes you would so say? No, that hold no, them? I don't like them. So it's not that they hold value. Everything that I mentioned holds value and goes up in value. Okay. It's that. So the Rolex thing is more common value. Okay. Mm, so gotcha. more common people know about them. That's right? why you said investment. So, yeah. okay. so most people wouldn't know what this is on, unless they've seen it in a rap video. You know, like they wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. So historically, if they see a gold Rolex, they assume you're wealthy, right? Yeah. So it's a more common form, just like having a Mercedes. Like, yeah. But if you know Mercedes, you know everybody can afford a C class. Right, it's not as special, right? So it's kind of the same thing, the way I look at those. So they have to be really special models, special dolls, like, you know, okay. John Mayer's Platinum Daytona's, et cetera. And they do well long term. They're good watches. Nothing wrong with them. But in my scale of business, it's very unusual for someone of my dollar to wear like something under a hundred grand on his wrist that right. isn't gotcha. special. Yeah. I Meaning it's not even about the money. You mean like an Arab dial roll. Yeah, it has some something like to be that. like, yeah. hey, you can't okay. get that. So someone asks, starts to talk to you about like, holy shit, like you're a real collector. You know, yeah. can't and drive a normal Lamborghini and be like, I got a black on black Lamborghini. Like, hey, it's just cool. Yeah. You know, like, and I know someone's going to say, but bro, I'm broke. What is it matter what watches I learn about? My thing is like, bro, learn now, but watches and cars. So when you get the money, you know what to do with it. Simple. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well. um, let's see here. Uh, Tyson Russell? Hefner goes, starting an LLC, went to apply for a business loan and was told it would take five to six months to get approved from the bank. Is that normal for a new business? Damn. Uh, it depends on the bank that you go to, man. Typically, if you go to a big bank, they might be lame, but credit unions will be a little bit more flexible. Also, look into SBA loans, man. Just don't commit any fraud because them boys will come after you. Come you know what sure, I'm saying? Bro. They don't play. Yeah, don't don't do scams with SBA like these other idiots. Like a bunch of them got arrested for doing them. Uh, the hey, loans. can I add something to that yeah, real please, quick to please. help them? So, banks. One thing you can do when you're starting a business and you need a loan, 
it's easier to get a personal credit line on your credit card. And it's very easy to then apply for a business credit card five months later, once your business is established Bam. and transfer the balance over. Mm. So, so one of the things that I would just recommend people do is if you're having a hard time, basically just try to get it under the business name with a personal guarantee. So you get like some kind of 20, 30 K credit line. And then five, six months later, basically you can get a new card without that personal guarantee and then transfer the balance over. So it's off of your personal, personal sheet. Yeah, exactly. But that, yeah. that's a good way to start when you're brand new at a business and like your business probably isn't known to go make money, you know, nice. like a bank. Won't look at that's a good, that's a there good tip go. right there. I like that. Cause guys, um, credit that's on your business account doesn't affect your personal credit score. Um, Liam LA, which is the main reason why it's so ad advantageous. This is aside from the podcast, but would you guys ever go on whatever? And can you invite chase from whatever? What? I don't know what you're talking about, but okay. <laughs> is that, is that a TV show? I don't know. Whatever. Right. I don't know who Chase okay. is, but. Okay. Benjamin, where can they find you, brother? Uh, easiest place to find me, learn from pj.com. The easiest place to learn about exotic car hacks, Watch Trading Academy. And if you want to pick up my books, they're all over Amazon, the Third Circle Theory, Gator Choice, or Radius. Bam. And the last thing for me, just real quick over your period of time on this earth, you've encountered many things in life. Describe yourself, as, you know what? Describe dating as you know now. Like, what does dating? that mean to you, dating? Yeah. Dating is about an opportunity for, I would say, an opportunity to get to know another soul mm -hmm. and to see if you vibe on an energy level as well as if you vibe on a societal level, like in your capacity for awareness, self-awareness, and just if you want either a partnership, uh, a submissive person. It's more about you personally. Like I think a lot of dating today is flawed because a lot of people don't know themselves enough for what they want. So they just go in with an open slate, kind of being like, I just want to meet the right person. But you don't even know what the right person would be. So ultimately, your argument is that you're just out there to smash and you're coming up with a reason that that's dating. If you want to fuck, then just go fuck. Like, you don't need to hide it under dating, you know? And I think that's half of these apps today are basically just fucking let's fuck. They're not really like <laughs> show Tinder. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're not they're not really like meaningful or an opportunity. I mean, all you have to do is just look at what people are saying about what they're looking for, right? Everybody's looking for a perfect version of what they're not themselves to give to the next person. So mm. it's like, hey, I want this perfect companion, mm -hmm. but I'm not the perfect companion to give you, <laughs> right? I mean, like, think about it. Like it, I, earlier, people were talking about like a woman and I want a woman that cleans and, and cooks and all that shit. That's great. But if you're a man of value, you have enough money to hire a cleaning lady. You don't need your woman to clean. Like uh, that's actually a low thing. I mean, she I'm sure she knows how to clean. Do you really need a woman to clean? Like, is that what you want out of a partner? That's the most powerful thing you want her to be is a cleaner or a cook. Like that's your highest expectation of the partner you're going to choose. Clean and cook. Like try to like clean, cook and fuck. But we can buy all those three things for a thousand bucks. I'm just being honest, man. Like it, this, this value people have of other people and what their thoughts are. And, but yet the people think they're of high value when that's the value they seek to receive from the opposite sex. So to me, it's just a joke, right? Like that, that person is never going to attract a powerful woman. And not every man should have a powerful woman by his side. And that's not what everybody wants, and that's okay. You know, every person can have the experience they wish to have in the world, whatever that is. You want a submissive chick that gives you blowjobs every day? Great, go find that. But what I'm saying is the expectation is, that's what I want from a woman, but as soon as she wants money from me, well, that's fucked up because she only wants me for my money. You only want her for fucking head game. Like, what do you... What, like, again, like, it, it doesn't make sense. So I think a lot of reasons why people get this satisfied from dating and just kind of find their voices in more to single life or submission or obedience. It just comes down to this misunderstanding of what value you're providing and value you're receiving. So it just creates a lot of discontent. And I think a lot of times uh, people just don't understand that it's okay to have different lifestyle choices. And I think that's the thing that a, a lot of times get lost in translation in a lot of shows is that of course, there's value in knowing that biologically women have a different role than men. And it's also important to understand that everybody's going to want a different experience out of a partnership or companionship or the things that matter. 
And, and that that's going to make a huge difference in how or who you seek, uh, who who you seek to attract as a partner. And I think that's why I think dating so fucked up is like basically the values you provide aren't the values you receive, and it's constantly a hit or miss. And then we're surprised when we don't get what we want, you know. And then we find a reason to basically turn down the other person as just incompetent or not exactly what we expected them to be. Yeah, we're at Target. I want a millionaire. Well said. <laughs> All right. Show us some ghosts coming up right now. Yeah, guys, and, the uh, ladies are here. We're going to go ahead and uh, get that going for y'all here very shortly. Um, so like the video, guys. Subscribe to the channel. Follow uh, Get the course. Uh, Pishman's links are all below if you guys want to check them out. Yep. We'll catch you guys back here. Chris, call it. Uh, 1030. 1030. All cool. right, cool. Catch you guys in a bit. Peace. Peace. I run, I run so far away.